so we consider 3P when you are a brand and you sell it to brick and mortar retailers mostly, and you allow those brick and mortar retailers to sell it to the end customer. And um, this is what a lot of brands have do, do um, uh, largely because it's kind of your default option. <laughs> and what I mean by that is uh, if Amazon hasn't reached out to you to, to buy 1P, um, there's probably a whole bunch of your brick and mortar retailers doing it. Hello, Ethan. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Trent. It's a pleasure to be on. I appreciate your reaching out. Talk to me. Yeah. No problem. Well, the, what we're going to be talking about is very timely and it's important for a lot of brands with all that's going on in the world these days. So I'm very happy to have you here. So for the folks who uh, maybe aren't familiar with who you are, let's begin there. Who are you and uh, what kind of business do you run? Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, Ethan McAfee and I'm the founder and CEO of Amify. Uh, and we really focus on helping uh, medium sized and large uh, brands um, really sell their product directly on the Amazon marketplace. And we do that through a service we call Amazon as a service, which is essentially we become your outsourced Amazon team. And we help brands from everything from, you know, creating their listings and optimizing them, but really focusing on the supply chain logistics, um, customer service, uh, and data and analytics side um, on the end as well. Okay. So for brands that, currently sell online and why do you think that they need to be thinking carefully about how they're leveraging the Amazon sales channel? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, what, what's kind of happened is that a lot of these brands, um, uh, need to really be thinking, especially around COVID times about how retail is changing. And if we kind of go back, uh, if we take like a history lesson, right, which it's, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, you had brands who would make products and they would sell their products or they, they basically needed to partner with retail distribution, um, you know, stores around the country, brick and mortar stores around the country to get their products in front of uh, customers. And uh, when the internet came along, yes, brands did start creating their own websites. Um, and about that same time was when Amazon was created. And, and most brands had taken what I call you know, they have always thought of Amazon as a retailer. Um, and so they would sell their products, to, you know, to a retailer who would then sell them on Amazon. And those retailers could either be Amazon 1P or, um, you know, 3P partners. And, you know, oftentimes those 3P partners were brick and mortar stores that kind of were ahead on the Amazon game. And so what we've really been focusing on and, and really trying to get brands to think about is how the world's changing and that, um, you've seen this, you know, huge explosion of what is commonly referred to as direct to consumer brands. Um, you know, these are the Warby Parkers of the world and the Allbirds who really built a whole brand around selling products on their website. And what we've always said is you need to think of Amazon, not as a retailer where you sell to um, a retailer who sells to end customers, but you really need to think of Amazon as a platform and an extension of your website. And um, all the advantages of selling on your website can also be done on Amazon, um, which is you know selling direct, cutting out the middleman, um, which allows you to make a lot more money. It also allows you to control your customer a lot more than selling through middlemen. Um, but then it also gives you a huge amount of access to data. And so most of these brands, or the majority of these brands, are still using middlemen on Amazon, and we kind of say, hey. Now's the time to go direct to your end customer on Amazon um, and view it as a channel, just like your website is. Um, and so that's me, what we've been me, focusing me, on. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I do want to push back or ask a question about one thing you yeah. talked about, you know, your customer. Well, when you're on Amazon, ain't your customer, it's Amazon's customer and you're not getting any customer data that I'm aware of. And I've been selling on Amazon for four years now. So can you elaborate on, on how you think that that is, because obviously on your website, you get all the customer data, but on Amazon, Correct. you don't. Yeah. So I think two, two things to, to break down there. One, I would say what I say, um, control your customer experience a lot more, right? Which it's mm -hmm. um, the way that your products are shown on Amazon should look a lot like okay. the way they're shown on your website. Agreed. And so what I always say is like, hey, 
if you're if you're a brand and you're not controlling your Amazon presence, that means somebody else is, <laughs> and yeah. that's they're not doing what you want to do. So that's thing one. Um, and then thing two, though, is as long as you use FBA, um, Amazon does give you a lot of customer data, right? So they, if you go in, um, they will give you name, address, um, uh, uh, information, as well as what people ordered and when they ordered it. And so that's that's very useful information um, to a lot of brands because now those brands know what is actually being sold real time, um, where in old wholesale relationships they don't. Um, but you can also start using that customer data for stuff like you know, um, what's the lifetime value of my customer? In other words, like how much, how many times is this person buying from me on Amazon? Um, you know, what's the customer acquisition cost on Amazon? And then you can, you can, you can take that data um, and combine it with your website data to really get stuff like, hey, is it better for my customer to be on my website versus Amazon um, and vice versa? Um, but you're not, you're not getting an email address for that customer. You're getting a name and a physical address. And I'm correct. guessing then are there services where you can, cause it's a, it's a violation of Amazon's term service to communicate directly with the customer via email. Correct. However, I'm, I'm actually not up to speed on whether it's a violation of their terms of service to mail them something in the regular mail. Are you allowed to do that? Yeah. And, and, and just to be clear, we're not suggesting that, um, uh, we're very, we, we do not try to take Amazon customers and move them, off Amazon we're, and we're not reaching out to them to try to get reviews or, or anything like that. What we're trying to say is the value of that data is super important for marketing um, analytics purposes. Okay. Um, so um, we're not using the data to like send uh, letters and, and anything like that. It's not actually contacting the customer whatsoever, okay, but so brands find that very information. value Correct. of the data. Okay. Yes, exactly. All right. So, Let's, um, I'm just looking at my questions here. There's three main ways that brands can sell on Amazon. What are the three? Yeah, so um, if, if you go back, the three main ways, way number one is kind of the beginning of uh, Amazon, which is, what is effectively Amazon 1P. Um, and this is where you as a brand sell your products directly to Amazon and then Amazon sells them to the end customer. And so this is probably best known when you go to Amazon and it says product sold by Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the way that Amazon was created, right? Which is yeah. Amazon owning products and reselling them to the end customer. Uh, and then about you know 15 years ago or so, they opened up the Amazon marketplace, which started allowing um, third party sellers to come in. Um, and so this was uh, the, the way Amazon was started, and it really is good uh, method for brands who are kind of lower price point commodity products um, that sell you know millions and millions of dollars. And so that was kind of the first model. Um, the second model that then started happening when brands really, um, or sorry, when Amazon opened up the marketplace was uh, third party retailers. And so this would be an example of, you know, Fender Guitar sells their guitars to Guitar Center and Guitar Center then opens up an Amazon seller account and sells yep. to the end customer that way. And so that was really the wave that you saw kind of in 2010 to 2015 where, you know, millions of Amazon sellers came onto the Amazon marketplace uh, and then started selling kind of being this, you know, Amazon middleman. And then the third model, which is what we really focus on, is when a brand decides that they want to sell direct to the end customer. And this is when, you know, say Fender would open up a Fender seller account um, and sell their, uh, their products directly to the end customer. Um, and that's what we focus on. And we think that's where the market's moving. Um, and so we focus on that. Um, and the issue, you know, the advantages of there is you usually make a lot more money because you're taking out those middlemen. Um, mm -hmm. The issues <laughs> is that as you're well aware, selling on Amazon is a very difficult thing and requires a lot of different uh, capabilities. And so that's why a huge, um, you know, Amazon consultants agency and what we call Amazon as a service um, has, has been uh, created. And, you know, our value proposition and most of our competitors value proposition is that, hey, we're going to be your Amazon presence for you. Um, and we can do it twice as good as you could ever do it at half the cost. And we can start tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we focus on. Yeah. And that's kind of um, where we think the market's going is 
you know, Amazon as a extension of your website as a direct to consumer um, channel. So for the brands who aren't sure which path they should go down, maybe they're on one of these paths and they're not happy right. and they're thinking about <clears throat> making changes. Let's talk about the considerations between 1P, 3P and your own Seller Central account. So let's start with 1P. Where do you think 1P is the best fit and where do you think 1P is the worst fit? Yeah, so 1P, which is selling directly to Amazon, is great for brands that are very, very large um, and simplifying it, this is stuff you can buy at Walmart and Target and stuff like that, which it's, they like tend to be very- and mouthwash <laughs> and deodorant. And Correct. Yep, these are, tend to be your household CPG names. Um, they send, tend to be very large selling, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Um, they tend to be very low price point, mm -hmm. um, kind of household names. Um, and specifically they're ones that the distribution channel is very fragmented, which is in other words, like, you can go into thousands of stores around the country and buy them. And also ones where you don't care too much about, I'm um, sorry, the brand doesn't care too much about the price. In other words, if the Crest toothpaste goes on sale by, you know, from Kroger for a dollar off, Crest is fine with that. Yeah. Um, and that's opposed to somebody like Apple or someone like that who says the Apple iPhone needs to be charged, you know, sold at the same price, no matter um, where it's sold yeah. at any time. Yeah. Um, so, so those are the type of brands um, that really be uh, that can really help um, on one P and the, and the key thing to understand with these is like low price products are very difficult to sell um, on Amazon outside of one P and the reason is is because shipping and handling costs really kind of factor into the, the equation a lot in other words like you know the you know the toothpaste to may cost three dollars at your Walmart um, but realistically, it probably costs two to three dollars to ship it to you. <laughs> and, yeah. and therefore, uh, to, to break even Amazon realistically needs to charge five or six dollars. But they'll sell it to you for three dollars and basically make a loss just because they want to compete against the brick and mortar presence. Well, plus they know too that if you can, if they can get you to come to Amazon and buy toothpaste, then you're probably going to buy like a dog collar and some other thing and some other thing and some other thing and they're going to make money on all those. <laughs> Of course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I mean, it's basically a, a loss leader. Um, you know, the story of always why they put milk in the back of a grocery store because everybody needs to buy milk. You know, these kind of CPG commodities are the ones that are great for 1P. Yep. Um, and, 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 and that's where, you know, Amazon now focuses, right? So 15 years ago, Amazon 1P was 100% of the Amazon marketplace. And now um, you've seen different statistics based on, um, unit orders versus um, uh, gross sales price. But you know, you're, you're talking now the Amazon marketplace is two thirds roughly of total sales and the 1P marketplace is roughly a third. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and so now let's talk about 3P. Obviously very popular. I mentioned I've been a seller for four years. I own a 3P business. Uh, there's definitely pros and cons to having them. However, if you do it right, from the three piece perspective, it can actually be a pretty nice business. Yeah. Um, but from the brand's perspective, what are some of the pros and cons of three P? Right. So we always, um, so we consider three P when you are a brand and you sell it to brick and mortar retailers mostly, and you allow those brick and mortar retailers to sell it to the end customer. And, um, this is what a lot of brands who've done do, um, uh, largely because it's kind of your default option. <laughs> and what I mean by that is uh, if Amazon hasn't reached out to you to, to buy 1P, um, there's probably a whole bunch of your brick and mortar retailers doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So the advantages of doing this is it's a very, very easy way for your brand to get on Amazon. Uh, it's probably already on Amazon if you like it or not doing this model. Um, and uh, the, 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 depending on where your business is and what type of business is, is uh, there's some strategic reasons why a lot of brands do this. So for instance, like we do a lot of work in um, like the shoe category. And so what, what you'll find is that a lot of the big shoe companies will say stuff like, hey, we really want to support our brick and mortar retailers. And so we're going to um, authorize maybe five or 10 of our largest brick and mortar retailers to sell on Amazon as well. And so this is a way to kind of give like a little jump start or kick, you know, um, 
for your brick and mortar partners uh, upside to sell their brands in the store and a reward for selling those um, products in the store. Um, so, so, so that's been um, one of the reasons. Uh, the second reason here is that oftentimes these uh, 3P retailers will offer, you know, also offer additional services. So, mm -hmm. you know, they'll do things like, hey, um, we will do your content. We'll make your product pages look really pretty. Um, we'll do some of your sponsored ads advertising for you. Maybe we'll do some of your unauthorized sellers and map monitoring services for you. Um, and in return, let us be the exclusive retailer or semi-exclusive mm -hmm. retailer for your brand. Um, and so, so that's where that kind of uh, 3P retail business is going. And this um, uh, you know, really makes sense for brands who just really like that um, wholesaler retailer relationship and that's what they've always done. It makes sense for brands who um, really value their brick and mortar partners and want to kind of give them some upside. Um, and so that's why a lot of brands do that. So what are some of the unintended consequences of a brand choosing the 3P path? Yeah, so the unintended consequences there is um, the default option, right? I think I'd say that 3P sellers are um, different levels of sophistication and you wanna make sure that your 3P partners are value, value added, right? Mm -hmm. Which it's, why am I allowing this person to sell my brand on Amazon? What value are they providing me? Um, and so, you know, if they're providing you content or Amazon advice, that's great. If they're providing, you know, you, or maybe they're one of your largest brick and mortar customers, that's great. But, you know, the vast majority of um, Amazon 3P sellers are, are what I would call, you know, non-value added retailers. In other words, leeches. like leeches, right. So if you already have 50 people selling your product on Amazon, offering the, you know, letting the 51st and the 52nd person selling doesn't add any value to your company. In fact, it just makes us much more competitive and um, uh, more time consuming. Um, and so the key here is like, you want to be focusing on people who add value um, that, uh, you know, view your brand as a, like a long-term partner rather than like a short-term leech. Yeah. And plus most of the, more, go ahead. With the more sellers that a brand deals with, I mean, just a simple thing of processing purchase orders and shipping orders. If you have 50 sellers splitting up the total volume, you're creating 50 times as much work for yourself. Whereas if you just had one partner, you only have one purchase order to deal with one order to ship, but the volume doesn't go up. So Correct. It, it can, it, it's really detrimental to the brand in every case I can think of. Maybe you could think of an exception to have a boatload of sellers selling their products. It just doesn't help them at all. Yeah, no, no. I think once you get over, I mean, there's, there, I think there's reasons to oftentimes have more than one, right? Mm -hmm. So if you only had one seller and that one seller runs out of stock, um, mm -hmm. then your product doesn't issue. have any representation. But like after you get over like three or four sellers, like each incremental one is detrimental to your time and health. Yeah. Um, and usually what then starts happening is um, you get into issues where there's um, large numbers of unauthorized sellers and, you know, people selling their prices below agreed upon prices um, and just kind of really quickly degrades. And so, you know, the main risk of, using 3P sellers is that unless somebody at your company is like actively monitoring them, um, you know, it can quickly <laughs> become a free for all on Amazon. And we always say like right now, you know, Amazon, especially because of COVID, your brand's um, Amazon strategy is probably the fastest growing area of your company. And mm -hmm. do you want to be the one owning that strategy or do you want some unauthorized seller who you don't know <laughs> to be <laughs> running your Amazon strategy on the, you know, the fastest growing and most, most important marketplace, um, at least in the United States. Yeah. Not generally a really great idea. Correct. Yeah. All right. So now let's get to the final way where the brand decides they're going to treat Amazon as an extension of their own website. They're going to treat it as a direct consumer channel. They're going to open their own seller central account. Um, what are the, some of the pros and cons of going down that path? Yeah, and so you know, basically, with um, the invention of uh, things like brand registry and stuff in Amazon, um, we're seeing more and more um, brands realizing that they want to go direct uh, on the Amazon platform. 
And so for us, there's really three main reasons why most brands want to do this. Um, the first is that by um, going direct, you're basically cutting out the middleman. And that means that the money that we used to be going into those people's pockets is now going into yours. And so, you know, um, oftentimes when we're talking with brands that focus on this, um, they'll come up to us and say like, well, um, how much, how much you guys charge for this type of service? And we can usually go back to them and say, no, no, you are going to make, um, you know, a, a lot more money. And so we recently, one of our clients, um, was selling about $20 million per year on the Amazon platform. Um, and they were doing it through, um, uh, 3P, like a, a semi-exclusive 3P relationship. Mm -hmm. And so they were basically selling their product at wholesale cost to these people who then sold it to the end customer. Um, and we did our analysis and we said, hey, you know, by taking out these middlemen, you're going to make $4 million more per year, even after all of our fees. Yeah. Um, and so, um, especially because of COVID times now, um, <laughs> you know, making more money definitely seems to be a, a lot more interesting. And so um, usually selling directly to your customer um, <laughs> makes financial sense. So that, so that's the main um the main reason why a lot of brands are moving this way. I think the second one is then gaining a little bit more control of the customer experience. Uh, and, when, and that's simply that you want to make uh, the Amazon experience for your customer uh, as close as possible to the experience that your website has to give them a great feeling. And, and, and obviously Amazon controls a lot of that experience, but uh, you want to make sure that your clients have great looking um, product pages that look a lot like your website. You wanna make sure that you have a Amazon storefront that's organized in a logical way, right? So what I mean by that is um, if you go to a well-organized storefront, let's just say it's like a clothing company, right? Um, you do a well-organized storefront, it has you know men's section, a women's section, and maybe it has tops and bottoms and shoes. And uh, you open up the shoes category and gives you a list of all the shoes. And that's just much more easy to follow than you type in clothes and it just gives you a list of all sorts of clothes by that brand, regardless of men's, women's, color, sizes, um, you know, shoes, socks, you know, tank tops, whatever. Um, so, 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 so you want to make sure that the, the brand imaging looks the same. Um, but you also, by selling direct, you also then control a lot of the customer service, especially around, you know, questions and answers. Um, so if a customer has a problem with it, they can ask you directly. Um, and at the end of the day, if you're a brand, would you rather have uh, the customer service representative be some random Amazon employee or someone at your company who could hopefully give that customer a better experience? So owning that customer experience, I think, is the second reason why a lot of brands are going. Uh, and then the third one, which we talked about a little bit before, is around data, right? Um, and so some of this stuff is kind of simple, but by selling direct to the end customer, you now know what is selling on a day-to-day -day basis uh, at retail. And mm -hmm. this is a lot different than your old relationship where you were a wholesaler. So for instance, with COVID, we have a lot of brands that, you know, some other brands are up 50% in revenue and others are down 50%. And that, because of COVID, that, that change happened pretty quickly. And so, you know, on some of the brands that we work with, like we saw revenue going up quickly, we could immediately communicate with them and say, hey, you know, demand for your yellow uh, t-shirt is skyrocketing because of COVID. You need to go and start making more yellow t-shirts right now. And they said, you know, a lot of the brands will come back to us and say like, thank you so much for this data. We've never had this ability before. Historically, we had to wait for two months and then our retail partner would then place another order for the products. And half the time we would then say, oh, we're out of stock of that. But now because we know what's going on at retail levels and what's selling, we can then change our supply chains, you know, one or two months ahead of time to make sure that we can fulfill that demand. Um, the second thing you can do with all the data, which we talked about briefly, is you can then um, start looking at, you know, how often are people buying on Amazon, how many new customers are buying on Amazon, and you can combine that data with the data from your Shopify or your website account and start asking questions like, well, how much does it cost to acquire a customer on Amazon versus how much does it cost to, how much does it cost to acquire a customer on my website? 
Um, what are my margins and profitability on those two? Um, what's my lifetime value? Like, you know, do certain ones maybe have a higher um, average cart size between those two? And so, so the access to that data you get by selling direct, whereas you don't get it um, selling through, um, you know, 3P partners or uh, to some extent on Amazon 1P. Yeah. So, so those are the advantages. Um, there's definitely some disadvantages though as well. And those are largely around, it's really complicated for most brands to properly execute a, um, uh, you know, a direct to consumer 3P strategy. Um, and that's why uh, companies like Amify have been created and, and, and others. Um, and the second I'd say is that, you know, sometimes your brick and mortar partners get upset with you uh, when you say, oh, you're no longer going to allow them to sell the Amazon channel. Well, one of the workarounds that we've advised our brand partners to do is rather than cut them off completely, we just tell them they can only sell via FBM and that tends to soften the blow Correct. Uh, versus yeah. selling FBA because they're going to, they're still accessible, but they're only going to get a tiny share of the buy box. Correct. Yeah, and, and that's actually, we, we do something similar um, with most of our brand partners and that's a great fallback, right? And yeah. in case, um, you know, right now, especially as we go into the Amazon's um, holiday season, you know, FBA warehouses are getting more crowded than ever and um, oftentimes take weeks to check products in. And so, hey, if we run out of stock, we wanna make sure that there's still backup supply. Yep. And letting our the 3P partners do that often makes sense. Does Amazon have a preference which way brands go? Obviously, if it's a big CP, CPG brand, Amazon wants them to be one piece. So let's exclude the, the monster brands from my question. For everybody else, does Amazon have a preference on how they want you to sell on their platform? Yeah, but I, I think we, let's take even a step back farther, which is what does Amazon really want to be on a retail platform, right? And so does Amazon... <laughs> Uh, if, if I were in Jeff Bezos's shoes, would I rather have be a retailer of product where I buy and own inventory and resell products, or would I rather be a marketplace where I sit back and mostly do nothing and take a 15% or, you know, cut? Um, and so I think the good news here is that in general, from everything I see is that Amazon for 15 or 20 years has said we would rather be a marketplace than a retailer and that's why fba and then third party marketplaces gained market share for 20 years and you know if you read the annual report last year it was the very first page that um of it talked about this fact um but from amazon so so i think the good news here is that amazon is trying to move away from being a one-piece seller for a lot of uh, a lot of brands um i think from amazon's perspective do they care so i think in general um Amazon prefers when brands are selling direct themselves. Um, in most cases, now there's some nuances here. So what does Amazon care about? So Amazon cares about a customer experience being great. And so when a brand is selling their products direct on Amazon, that customer experience is usually better than when a third party is selling direct or is telling. And, and, the, and the reason why that is, is the content is usually better. The customer service is usually better they know it's authentic, right? And so obviously mm -hmm. there's a huge issues now with counterfeit products and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So in general, Amazon likes it when brands sell direct 1P. I'd say the reasons why Amazon sometimes doesn't um, is usually around prices. Uh, and what I mean by that is Amazon wants to be the lowest priced person um, on the planet for all these products. And oftentimes when a brand sells their products direct, they charge the same price they do on their website as on Amazon, whereas, mm -hmm oftentimes these 3P sellers will undercut website prices and, and stuff like that. And so um, I think Amazon likes what I call healthy competition on prices, but oftentimes that healthy competition is not in the brand's best interest. Um, Most times it's actually not in the brand's, brand's, brand's best interest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not um, in the, the brand's best interest unless that I call it a commodity product where you're really yeah. competing on price. So, Amazon is, I think, mostly for, I think, I think what Amazon has done over the last couple of years is they have seen, they, they wanted to be an unbelievably open marketplace, which allowed everybody to sell everything at any price. And I think what you've seen over the last two or three years is they realized that the downfall of that strategy has been a huge amount of counterfeit and unauthorized sellers and gray market goods, which is 
basically impacted the customer confidence to buy on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so Amazon has now kind of come back against and said, okay, no, no, we really need to limit um, this total free market. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so that's why you've seen uh, a couple things over the last few years, which is one, one, you know, the number of suspensions on Amazon accounts has skyrocketed, um, uh, mostly because of you know you, dirty seller tricks, I'd say, um, and counterfeit products. Um, and the other thing that you've seen recently, which happened just you know a month ago or so, is that now they're finally showing Amazon seller account names, mm -hmm. right? So it used to be that you could go buy a product from. XYZ Corp on Amazon and you had to have no idea who it was and it's just hiding behind the Amazon storefront. Whereas now they show you the name and address, um, which gives more customer confidence. It also gives um, a place for brands to go after. <laughs> um, oh yeah, <laughs> it's made it so much easier for brands to identify unauthorized sellers. That was it's a whack-a-mole game before and now it's oh. just look them up and that's who they are. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, and, and again, the brands still need to pay attention, but. Uh, the point here is that Amazon is kind of finally saying, hey, we want to have a managed marketplace that the free for all that we've kind of seen over the last three or four years actually is bad for customers yeah. um, and therefore it's bad for Amazon. So way early on around the introduction phase of our interview, you mentioned some, a service that you perform for your clients and you referenced supply chain optimization or something along those lines help myself and the audience to understand what that is, why that's important, how, what the impact on the brand is and so forth. Yeah. And so, you know, we call our service Amazon as a service. And what that is, is we are meant to be your outsourced Amazon team. And, you know, you'll hear a lot of people talk about, Hey, we're going to be, you know, agencies and such. They'll talk about stuff like, Hey, we're really good at PPC advertising or we're really good at content creation. Um, for us, we're really trying to solve the customer's problems um, and be their Amazon partner. And, and, and half the problems aren't how much sales we're going to get, but it's kind of ugly back end office stuff that uh, isn't very sexy to talk about on podcasts, but um, it's unbelievably important for actually running the business. And so one of those is that we work with our brands on is um, supply chain management and supply chain for or inventory forecasting. And so um, what that basically is, is these brands are selling products on Amazon and we need to make sure, I always say it's like the three little pigs, right? Um, you need to have inventory levels in Amazon that are, just about right. And what you end up happening is that for the vast majority of our brand partners, especially when we take them on, they either have, they're co constantly running out of stock of product on Amazon and therefore they're just giving up a huge amount of uh, inventory or uh, sales. Yeah. Or <laughs> what happens oftentimes is that they have years worth of supply of products <laughs> for a certain products that haven't sold in a long time. And so therefore they have a huge amount of inventory tied up, cash tied up in an inventory. And so we work with those brands. Step one, it's, hey, let's work on coming down to a, a catalog that makes sense to sell on Amazon. Um, then let's do some demand forecasting on how much we think we're gonna sell. And then let's start putting into a, together like a supply chain and ordering cadence that makes sure that you have enough inventory at Amazon, but not too much. Uh, and oftentimes that then starts getting involved into things like, hey, your products are made in China and it takes you know, three months for a container load of product to be shipped from China. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we have that container load of China ship, uh, container load of product from China shipped directly to an Amify warehouse and we're gonna open up that container and we're gonna ship you know, half of it to Amazon right now <laughs> And then we're going to monitor those inventory levels and continue to send products in to make sure that it's always in stock, but not too much is in stock going forward. Um, and so those are kind of those like kind of ugly back office services that um, it's just super important to know because at the end of the day, uh, you know, inventory is cash. Yep. Um, and certainly is. small and mid-sized businesses need to make sure that they're operating on, you know, on the cash levels uh, properly. All right. So before we wrap up, Ethan, if you were interviewing yourself on this topic, uh, is there any questions 
that we haven't, that I haven't asked you that you think would add value to this particular interview and, and help brands to better understand really what they should be doing with respect to the Amazon sales channel? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the most important thing for brands to do is have a strategy and a plan. And um, oftentimes when I look at Amazon and, and brands on Amazon is that most of these brands just don't have a strategy or they say that they're working on a strategy. And so for me, the first important thing is to decide. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and from there, to be honest with you, like um, the basics stuff is just the most important stuff. And what I mean by that is like, who at your company is in charge of the Amazon presence? It can't be 10 different people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what is your Amazon strategy? Is it going to be a one piece strategy? Is it going to be a retailer strategy or is it going to be going direct strategy? Um, and then it's um, also know what game you're playing. And what I mean by that is if you are a big established brand that has brick and mortar partners, you need to be thinking through those ramifications. Whereas if you're a lean startup, um, you need to be thinking about like, how can I launch my product on Amazon and such? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ethan, it's been a pleasure. Thoroughly Great hey, conversation. Trent, thanks so much. Hope this was helpful for you and um, all your listeners. Appreciate your Indeed. time. I'm sure it will be uh, when it goes live. We'll be sure and let you know. Great. Hey, have a good one. Thanks so much. 